Ready to go. For sure. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we just give you praise and glory. What exciting days it is to be alive and serving you, Lord. We're just so grateful for your grace and favor. Grace on our homes and our families. Grace on our church. Grace on this wonderful nation. Father, where will we be without you? Your grace and your favor. We just thank you, Lord. It's not by might, it's not by power. It's certainly not by our brilliant intellect. It's by your spirit. It's by your spirit. Just thank you for Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to thank Pastor just for the opportunities to share the word of God. Never take it for granted. Never take it lightly. You know, we've been in ministry a long time. That doesn't mean we know everything or profess to know everything. But, hey, just sharing with you what God's done in our own lives. The lives of the people. Uh, we pastor, what, maybe 50 pastors around the place, and just, you know, just what God's doing in the nation. In Luke chapter 21, if you'll turn there with me, and uh, reading from verse 7, they're asking Jesus, what will be the sign of him coming? They're not asking some end time prophet, you ask three prophets, you get three different ideas, thank you for your enthusiasm, but here they're asking Jesus. And it says, uh, uh, so they ask him, saying, Teacher, when will these things be? What will be the sign will it be when these uh, things are about to take place? The first thing he says is, take heed that no one be to sit. He didn't say six, 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 and the stormtroopers are coming. You know, he says, so the first thing he talks about is deception. You know, we live in an age of deception. We really do. You don't have to be, is that right? Don't have to be a rocket scientist. You know, uh, that deception is one of the most common things. And they go on, they talk about other signs. But verse 26 he says, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. doesn't even say necessarily the things that are happening, but the expectation of what they think is going to come. Fear's got a lot to do with the future. Not necessarily just what is happening, but what they expect may happen. You know, just Jen's, well anyway, here you're talking about failing. That word fail means to fail or bring down life. You know, uh, we live in stressful days. I'm sure it's the same here in your country as what it is in mine. I was reading uh, Time magazine several years ago. They said that the stress levels today equal, equal the mental patients of the 1950s and 60s. So what's considered normal today, you were a nutcase back in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make it up. So that's where the stress levels are. We just accept them as normal now. We pop pills more than any other generation has. Is that right? We just consider things that are normal. You know, that's just how far I... And we do live in stressful days. You know, if you're in talking to medics, but stress is a major cause of things like cancer, heart disease, mental breakdowns, domestic violence, suicide, drugs, crime, road rage. I don't know about your country, but suicide's off the Richter scale in our country. The number one cause of death among teenagers of Australians is suicide. How bad is that? We're ministering to a 15-year-old the other day. 15 years old is contemplating suicide. I said, you've got your whole life in front of you. My goodness, I wasn't even a Christian when I was that age, but it never ended my mind about suicide. Something is seriously wrong. You know, as I say about stress, and we just, you know, there's no shortage today of seminars about healing and the Holy Spirit and finance, and that's great, but there's very little about walking in the peace of God. Mm -hmm. Even just receiving the priest. Is that right or not? Yeah. Uh, you know, Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I'm God. Yeah. I don't even know if we even know how what it is to be still anymore. Yeah. We even have things called caravans, houses on wheels, so we can move them. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, everything's about moving, is that right? And, and, and it sort of bothers me. Just think about an ADV in kids. All you got to do is be a normal boy, I think, that I name Rack your I'm Redland, and things like that. You know, is that right? Not violence in the home. My son's a detective. Um, my son's a detective. His wife is a police officer. We've got Dirty Harriet and Dirty Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> the number one threat to a child today comes from its own family. How bad is that? Oh, I'm not making things up. My son goes to you know seminars with the sometimes with the FBI. The number one threat to a child comes from it in its own family. That, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, stress, as I say, it makes people do. Just things totally out of character, divorce, violence in the home. You know, so many of us are running on on adrenaline. What happens? You know, it's just accepted as normal to run on adrenaline. What happens when the adrenaline runs out? We have a thing called a breakdown. 
<laughs> well, we hit the wall. Is that right? All of a sudden. Anyway. You know, and sometimes I think we, we're looking for peace in a bottle or a pill or a place. You know, it's amazing to me. You know, peace is a place. So many Aussies want to go to Bali. If I could just go to Bali. We were in Bali two years ago. Half of Balinese want to move to Australia. <laughs> and he persists. Oh, I don't make it up. We're over there and this Balinese taxi driver was pleading with us. He said, please, could you help me get to Australia? He said, I've worked 60 hours. And I said, Swim out and catch the boat. Leaves every morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm not politically correct, as you can tell. I said, you can swim into Australia. They'll get your house and a car and a boat. You would never have to work again. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I said, that's not what you're talking about. You're idiot. Well, she can call me an idiot, but anyway. But you know, we sort of think that peace. What do you do when you get to Bali? Look in the mirror. You took your biggest problem with you. You. <laughs> How do you get away from you? Is that right or not? No matter where you are, huh? when you look in the mirror, the biggest problem you have is you to the wheel. Anyway, thank you for your <laughs> You know, peace is not a, you know, a formula, it's not really a place, it's a person. Yes. If you're not believe me, look at Ephesians chapter 2. Can I have an amen? Amen. In Ephesians chapter 2, I've got a new Bible, it's not really opening for the right pages yet. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace. So peace is a person. There's no peace without the Prince of Peace. You can search where you like, you can go, and you can do what you like. But there is no peace without the Prince of Peace. For he himself is our peace, has made us both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh. The enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as to declare in himself one new man from thus making thus making peace. And he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death empty. And he came and preached what? Peace. 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 I was just thinking about, you know, peace is a person. You know, is that right? You know, some people it, it just don't seem to be able, no matter what happens, to, to experience peace. But other people, you know, you can be living in a combat zone, is that right? But there's still that peace of God. Jen and I just come back from uh, uh, from Singapore, we went to Thailand afterwards. We went to see a, a friend who runs uh, children's homes and plants uh, 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 churches up there. He's got two adopted sons. Beautiful young boys, he paid four dollars each for them. Buy a life for four dollars. I mean, hello? You live in an affluent country, beautiful country, is that right or not? I mean, every morning you wake up, you should give thanks. Yes. Nobody woke up in Afghanistan. Yeah, right. These young boys, four dollars, they were stuffed, they're, they're twins, and so, you know, twins are bad luck, so they sell them, they either murder them or they put them, sell them to the drug, drug triads. You paid four dollars each. And so we're up there, you know, just spending some time there. But we had a day off, so uh, Jen wanted to ride the elephants. I wanted to go and see tigers. <laughs> the sons of our tiger. And so we go to the tiger world, you know. And so you actually sign the thing, but you go in a cage with six fully grown live tigers. <laughs> I was thinking afterwards, am I nuts or anyway? <laughs> it was huge. I actually laid on the tiger, I think. Yeah, you, anyway, I'm laying on the. I, 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 later on, we found out later some. Some lady got swiped 50 stitches. I mean, they're, they're paws, their heads are like this. One of them, you know, turned around and roared at us. I needed to change a bummy clothes. <laughs> but you know something? When we were there, there was just a piece of God. We prayed about it before. Just a piece of... Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And afterwards, I'm thinking, am I nuts? Oh, what? Really? You know, afterwards, after the adrenaline rush, but it was just awesome. Just a piece of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 1974, Cyclone Tracy hit our city, wiped out our city, 11,000 houses, including our house. We built a brand new home. We'd been in the home six months. In the middle of the night, roofs lifting, you know, and Jen's crying because her curtains are being ruined. Next day, zip no house, gone with the wind, blew away with the wind. Hello. Run across to the neighbours. People in our street were killed. We ran across to our kids under the table. Jen got in the broom closet. She stayed there for six hours. But you know, all hell's breaking loose, the house is being disintegrated, but there's a piece of God. Amen. That you don't, your mind doesn't even understand. Your mind's going, you don't understand what's going on. Is that right or not? Because that, that dome of peace drops up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where other people are living in affluence and that, and they've got to take pills to experience peace. 
Jesus is our peace. Amen. Is that right? Yes. He is our peace. And I was just thinking about there is no peace without the Prince of Peace. Can I have an amen? amen. I mean, just think about that. You know, even our English words for disease, split it up. Disease. That's where the word comes from. Disease. And I know that your students are great to see Pat and the family here, students of the Word of God. You know, everybody that's a student of the Word knows the word for healing is Jehovah Rapha, yeah. the Lord that heals you. But if you go a little bit deeper and you actually go back to the root word of that word Rapha, it actually means to relax. So the root word where healing comes from is to relax. I'm not sure if we even know how to relax. I'm not sure if we even know what peace is anymore. I'm not sure... The world's going nuts fast. Is that right? I mean, it really is. Just look around. And it's going nuts fast. We live in the anxiety society. You know, my wife and I are working. Well, she's working with three pastor's wives that want to quit. The husbands don't know they want to quit. They just want to quit. Not only on the ministry, they want to quit on the marriage. They just want out. I can't handle the pressure anymore. So if that's what's going on in the pulpit, what must be going on in the pews? And in the... Uh, you know, one... One man, and I believe he thought he was doing the right thing, he says, but I've taken you all over the world. His wife said, no, you've dragged me all over the world. There's a big difference if you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Have an amen or what? Yeah. So, you know, and I'm just thinking, my goodness, if that's what's going on in the ministry, what must be going on outside in the world right now? You know, is that right? And, you know, psychologists and psychologists, I'm just not here right now. We had a lady in our church that taught psychology, lectures all over the world. She had more problems than most of the people. Yes. <laughs> all right, thank you. For, this is a professional anyway. You know, we would spend more time, I think, with her. You go to Matthew with me, the Gospel of Matthew. How many of you have believed the Bible? Yes. And you really do believe the Word of God? Yes. In Matthew chapter 11, I love this in verse 28. Red letters, that doesn't mean they run out of black ink. This is Jesus speaking. And so he says in verse, 20, uh, verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and are what? I'm going to give you rest. Everybody say, give you rest. And so you've got to pray for it. Then you've got to fast for it. No 14 steps and 34 formulas. He actually says, if you come to me, I'll actually give it to you. Anytime you see the word gives, it's talking about the grace of God. Amen. Unmerited, unearned favor. Amen. He didn't say anything that you have to do. You've got to get your life straightened out. All he said is, could you come to me? Yeah, so if we respond and we actually come to him, is that right or not? Not earn, not pray, not fast, but our response is, if we come to him, his response is, I'll give you this. Is that, that's awesome. I don't know about it. The Amplified says, I'll cause you to rest. Yes. Yes. Is that good or what? Yes. I mean, in a world that's fast going nuts and we're trying to find it everywhere we possibly... He says, I'll, I'll actually give you... I'll, I'll, that word rest in the Greek is anaposis. Refresh and relax. Mm. I'll cause you to refresh and relax. Awesome. You know, I'm talking about pastors and things like that. I've got a friend in ministry and... Uh, I went to preach for him and I didn't notice his wife's had a nervous breakdown. His wife used to prophesy, preach in the church. For the last three years, she's not even, she can't even go to church. She just can't even handle, you know, just being around people. And I just preached on the grace of God, the goodness of God, unmerited favor. You know, I didn't even pray for her. Sometimes you pray, pray for people, you know, until they got friction burns on their head, they don't get it. <laughs> just the grace of God I touched her in a seat like that. I got a phone call uh, a, a little bit later, so I got my wife, my wife back. She's back. She's up proper science. She's back. Praise the Lord. Grace of God. Just that. If you come to me, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Maybe some of you need that. I don't know. Maybe you're going through a a hard time, maybe a nervous breakdown, whatever it is. Listen to the way that message puts it. I don't always like the message, but I like this passage. He says, that you're tired and you're worn out, burnt out on religion. Come to me, get away with me, and you will cover your life. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Listen to this. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced rhythms of there's so much striving, there's so much stressing. Is that why we try to make things happen sometimes? You know, Jesus may be your saviour, but is he really your Lord? I'm not just playing on words. Look with me at Luke here, Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, <clears throat> in, uh, let me just pick it up. So verse 46, and Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things which I ask you to do? 
Is that right? So he may be your saviour, but if he really is your Lord, you actually do what he asks you to do. Amen. Can I have an amen on? Amen. You know, I'm sitting in the church. Actually, I was sitting in Joseph's Prince Church in Singapore five, six years ago. The Spirit of God said, spoke to me, said, I may be your saviour, but am I really your Lord? Or do you just do what you want to do? I call it God. I don't mean to be smart, but I wonder how much of the church is not even led as driven. Just driven by their own flesh. I have friends in ministry that are not led. They're just driven. Any time that you're pressed and stressed, you're being driven. You're not being led. And here's a revelation. The Holy Ghost doesn't drive. He leads. The shepherd leads. It's the sheepdog that drives. Hello? Is that too deep? Now, any time that you've got this compulsion that you have, it's not God. I, I don't care. It's not God. God doesn't do that. He leads us. And the Bible talks about not violating your peace. If you don't have a peace about something, then really you shouldn't be doing it. You know, as I say, you know, so, so often it's driven. I'm sitting here in this, in this meeting and he says, are you really led or are you just driven by your flesh? And we just call it God. God, I feel the love's going to come around like that. I know you folks. I'm not trying to buy anything. You know, A.W. Tozer writes this. He says, I accomplish more when I rest wholly in the labor of Jesus then when I do, when I frantically try to work it out for myself, trust and obey and get out of the way. <laughs> Real deep. Is that right or not? Just think about that. Are you led or are you driven? You know, just think about that, led or driven. You know, really, what I love about the, it's, the grace is not a message, it's a person. Yes. He's really bringing Jesus back as the focal point of the church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not all about you. It's not about me. It's about him. Amen. And somewhere along the line, we've seen the God off. Is that right? I don't mean to be smart. But, you know, just think about it. It's all about him. He said, I'll build my church, not your church. Yeah. He said, if I be lifted up, not if you be lifted up. You know, sometimes, and maybe I've even done it myself, sometimes, you know, you've just come back from India, you've got 30,000 people saved, and hell, you praise God. God, Jesus doesn't get a mention. It's all about us. We live in a very selfish society. I'm going to go. We even have things called iPhones and iPads. It's all about us. Do I like This is the most selfish generation we have. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of it. Hello. We're in love with our mirrors. If anybody else fell in love with us, we'd get jealous. You think I'm kidding? But... What's the predominant side of the house? Is that right? What's the predominant sign of the last days? Is that right? Paul doesn't say 666 in the storm He says, men will be lovers of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in that generation. Don't tell me it's not in the church. Yeah. Uh, hello? My mum and dad were married to each other for 72 years. To each other. Yeah. Hello? They only say the last 10 years, 72 years to each other. I had never, ever in my life heard them use the term divorce. Murder lots of times. <laughs> <laughs> So I said on my dad's bed when he's dying in his 90s, he's ready to go. I said, Dad, how's it possible to stay married to the same lady for 72 years? I'm expecting this great formula and plenty of five steps. He looked at me and said, just learn to be less selfish. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. See, that would halve the yeah. divorce rate, that one thing along. Yeah. Our young people are so woefully and adequately prepared for marriage. Yeah. I mean, it scares me sometimes. They don't prepare for marriage, they prepare for a wedding. Yes. Yeah. It's all about a wedding. Well, what happens when the wedding's over? <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, the hair, pff, the right? <laughs> ET phone home, ET go home. Right? With all the makeup scores. <laughs> Is this too deep? <laughs> Hello? Is that I'm not going. You know, my dad grew up in a, in a large family. I'm sure there's people here from large families. Is that right? You grew up in a large family. Twelve kids in the family. You don't grow up selfish. First up's best dressed. <laughs> it has the longest arm eats the, eats the most. Just leave in a bed with six kids. Half wet the bed, the other half turned out to be great swimmers. <laughs> you can't say that. Can you? You're not a puppet. That you don't grow up selfish. You know, the son, my, I love my grandkids. I love my grandkids. But, you know, small families, one or two kids, and they think the world revolves around them. Exactly. It's all about me. It's all about me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> somebody will go and draw a swastika on my car or something. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's sad. Uh, you know, sometimes in, you tell your grandkids, share it or lose it. It's mine, Papa. I don't give a rip whose it is. Share it or lose it. Or the spirit of slap coming on, Papa. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> 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 
Don't tell me it's not in the church. You know, before I was saved, I, I, I really was. I mean, I'm not saying I'm wonderful now, but I was selfish. You know, it's hard, really, until you get born again and you look into that faultless law of liberty. And you get a look in that mirror, is that right? And you actually get a look at what you're, you... Most people don't even realise what you're like before. I mean, my wife wanted the luxuries of life, like food and clothes. <laughs> I wanted necessities like fish and rods and shoes and guns. What's the matter with you? <laughs> you know, the first area God dealt with me was selfishness. And I thought, am I really this selfish mongrel? Yes, you are. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I'm wonderful now, but anybody know what I've got? Allow the Spirit of God to deal with those things in your life. You know, my wife loves the shopping. She's got a back belt in shopping. She's anointed to shop. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> Six foot three before I went shopping. <laughs> but you know, the Spirit of God says it's so hard to do something like that. Your wife likes it. I said, Watch my mouth. Yes, it is. <laughs> Don't you love it? You know, yeah, I went with Jan one time with the two grand, with the two daughters when they were teenagers. They tried 33 outfits on. Wow. I'm sitting there, I've got cobwebs hanging on. <laughs> Don't you love it? Hello. They come out, does this make my bum look bigger? <laughs> Like, don't you love it? Somebody comes out, they don't even know you, they're strangers. Is that right? What about this? I mean, like hail damage all over everything else. Is that right? I don't speak English. Hello? I'm no fool. Hello? Like when some woman asks you, how old are you? Then I am. I ain't going. Is that right? But, you know, I was just thinking about this. Dear God, thank you, Jesus. Why do you call me Lord? You don't even do the things that I ask you to do. Can I have an amen or not? Maybe you save you, but if he is your Lord, you do. Is that right or not? You just do what he asks you to do. You know, I remember years ago, you know, when we uh, we handed our church over and we moved to the Gold Coast and different ones were on television, uh, Brother Hagen, or Brother Copeland anyway, some lady with some small ministry called Joyce Myers. <laughs> so, I, so I thought, that, you know, I like this idea, so I go and I sign a contract with the television. It costs more, I don't have a church, it costs more to produce the program than it does to put it on the channel. You know, I've got a hiring camera members and so I get it and I get my, but you know, the way we go and three months later, there's no money coming in. I said, hello God, do you remember me? <laughs> I said, you know, you, you're paying Brother Copeland's and other Jerry Seville's. How about me? He said, here's a, 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 a word for you, a revelation. I never told you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you, made, you, you, you did what you want to do. It's your own idea. Pay your own bills. That'll jerk the slack out of your room. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go down the tube financially, go on television if it's not God. It's a bottomless pit. Yeah. And I'm saying, well, hello. He said, I never once told you to go on television. That's what you did, that's what you saw, you wanted to do it, pay your own bills. That jerked the slack out of me real quick, hello. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? What's my excuse for breathing the oxygen? And he showed me straight away, and as soon as he spoke to me, I knew that's what I should have been doing. What do you call me? Watch out your halos don't slip down and strangle you to death. <laughs> Is that right? Or not? Should we have an order for for lies? You know what? I mean, just the spirit of God. Is that right? Or not? You have a peace about something. Is that right? Or not? You know, may not even really want to do it, but there's a peace about it. We moved to the United States. What back in the the late seventies? You know, totally out the will of God. I just, I even had a couple of prophecies which came together. A couple of words went over there. That, I'm from the Northern Territory. I owned a gun shop before I was in ministry. Not a real good start to ministry, but I owned a gun shop, you know. And so uh, we would take people out shooting and fishing. I'd walked on the back of crocodiles in the mud, actually stepped on their back. I've been charged by wild pigs. Never got a scratch. And I arrived in the United States out of the will of God. Hello. I end up with in the hospital with mononucleosis and hepatitis together. Now, I'm not saying God told, did that to me. But, you know, totally out of the will of God. You know, does anybody know what I'm talking about? I convinced myself it was God. And I'll never forget the Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, wake up. I never even called you. He go home and do what you're supposed to be doing. We packed up, went home. I started the church. That church turned out to be the largest church in our state. Despite what I did, God still blessed that church. Amen. The grace of God. Can I have an amen? Just lining up with the grace of God, the goodness of God. 
unmerited favor of God. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but where would we be even without the grace of God? And what I see, what I love about it, we begin to see people, you know, that have they've lost the, 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 the desire to, to, to minister, lost all the will for ministry, sometimes even lost the zest for marriage. You can see it over and over. One even lost the zest for life. One was even going to take his own life. And just see them touched by that message of grace. You know, if I can, you know, and the changes and the marriages restored, the church, the, the joy, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Yes. All of a sudden the joy is back. And I am, amen. Yes. You know, I, I love joyful people. You know, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. That if you lose your joy, you will lose your strength. Yes. Can I have an amen? Yes. When I first joined, got into ministry, I'll never forget the guy that was the pastor at the time was the cruise director for the Titanic. <laughs> Cheerleaders for the next depression. Hello? This bloke was baptized in vinegar. And he says to me, if you want to make it in ministry, you better lose your sense of humor. That's what he said to me. I said, I, said, I don't want to, and I certainly don't want to be like you. <laughs> That's why you're claiming the claim to be. You could brighten up any room simply by leaving it. <laughs> I don't want to be that sort of person. The joy of the Lord. Is that right? I, I notice with that grace, the joy comes back to people's life. All of a sudden, they've got joy about them. Just the simple things. It's, can I have an amen? Or is that joy? I was telling you, we lost our, our house in Cyclone Tracy. And so we race across and throw our kids under the table, you know. I think I'm going to die. Jen's convinced we're going to live. I think we're going to die. Hello. You know, made my peace with God. But even in the midst of a crisis, you can still have joy. The Bible says, at destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Most of us can't even laugh when things are going well, let alone when things are going bad. <laughs> I'm under the table. Hello, the house has been destroyed. You know, we're trapped there for five, six hours. I mean, neighbors, the kids, we're all under one table on your arms and your legs. You're all tangled up together. It's raining, it's glass. You know, winds howling, people screaming, you know. And after five hours, I can't feel my legs. Pins and needles, I'm going, I can't feel my legs. And I'm pinching, I can't feel my legs. This lady next to me said, if you don't stop playing with my legs, I'll slap you. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. And we saw it 10 years later. She said, you remember me? You were playing with my legs. I said, <laughs> you know, it's, praise God for kids. Kids will keep you sane. So, I mean, we've lost their house. It's been destroyed. Everything's gone. And their kids said, forget the house. It's Christmas Day. Yeah. What do we get for Christmas? <laughs> You're running around with 50 cent flute. The great God, my kids will keep you safe. But you know, the Spirit of God, it's amazing. The Bible does say that God meets them that rejoice. God doesn't want to hang around with South Coast Christians. Just think about it. If you can't wake up in the morning with a smile on your face, go to bed with a coat hanging in your mouth. There has to be some way for you to hold on to that joy. And that joy comes to peace of God as well. I really believe that joy comes to peace. If you lose it, you lose your strength. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first thing that goes in a crisis is your joy. Is this not true? Yes. Yes. Oh, we've worked with people with nervous breakdowns. I remember one man, a pastor, had a really bad nervous breakdown. We flew him up to our city in Darwin. We ministered to him, prayed for him, cast the devil out of him, all sorts of things. Hello, laid hands on him till he had friction burns on his head. Nothing worked. <laughs> we got all these old funny movies, Mr. Bean, Jen and I on the floor, and it's never strong. He's sitting like a <laughs> <laughs> in the window of a fish shop. <laughs> And I realize how hard it is if you've lost your joy. Yeah. Joy is easier to retain than it is to regain. Yeah. And once it's gone, so will go your peace. Can I have an amen? amen? You know, we've lost our house, everything's gone. At Christmas Day, I went back. You know, it, your mind, it's like, a, it's like you're in shock. You know, you don't want to accept, I'm looking out of a destruction. Hiroshima, there's nothing left. I mean, people are being killed, the houses are destroyed, trucks upside down. You know, and I'm looking now, I'm staring into outer space, and I'm, I'm, I'm in shock. I mean, hello? I'm sure God's trying to talk to me, but I'm just totally immersed in, in the problem. And down the road comes a 16-year-old kid, teenager, and he's whistling. He's stepping over the wreckage, and he looks up and says, Morning, Cole, having breakfast on the patio today? <laughs> Mental one must have blown him down. And he's 
started laughing. I couldn't help it. I started laughing. I think, Jan thinks I'm ready for cutting out paper dolls. <laughs> I'm laughing. It's so stupid. Are you laughing? And the Spirit of God spoke. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm on Sunday. He like, I mean, if you can't be honest with God, who can you be honest with? Yeah. You know what he said to me? He said, you're alive. Your wife's alive. Your kids are alive. Your dog doesn't have a scratch. You're not going to get on with your life. That was the best year I ever had in business. A lot of people just fled. They just run away. You know, fear does, does awful things to people. You know, sadly, you know, sometimes you get people that even add to that. I mean, I'm just a rookie. I don't know anything. The pastor's gone. His, his wife's been dead, hurt, and so I'm in charge. I don't know anything. I'm a rookie. Hello. In the middle of one Sunday morning meeting, this prophet, well, that reckons he's a prophet. I think he was more of a loss myself, jumps up and starts prophesying that God is going to send another cyclone and finish us off. Oh, no. I saw the blood draining in the people's faces. You know, fear. People just jumped in their cars. They left. They sold their homes and ran away. Hello. If that was today, I'm coming over for some way. God doesn't have to use the weapons of the devil. That's right. I don't find that God uses fear. But if you want to motivate people quickly, forget about faith. Fear motivates them much more. Is that right? I'm just being honest. People, you watch as fear comes, blood drains, they lose their joy, they lose their peace. You know, but here he's talking about. You know, he says, why do you call me Lord? You don't even do what I ask you to do. As I say here, you know, I, I, I really believe that. It's just bringing Jesus back as the focal, the goodness of God. You know, in Romans chapter 5, if you'll go there with me, Romans, how many of you still believe the Bible? In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have had access by faith into this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Notice what he says. He says, we don't only have peace of God, we have peace with God. There's a big difference between having peace with God and the peace of God. Lots of people may have the peace of God, but they don't have peace with God. Because they don't think God, well, they think God's out to get them. If I do something wrong, he's waiting just to smash me. Can I have an amen? I remember when we first got saved, it was back in the early days, they were showing those movies, Blood on the Mountain, all those terrible things about the end times, there'd be no trees and all that. I mean, hello, it would scare hell out of you. It probably did. Yes. <laughs> I'll never forget this bloke gets up and he preaches that God is making a movie of your life. And when you get to heaven, yes. he's going to play it after that's a movie from hell. Yes. <laughs> that's a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't let facts get in the way of a good story. The Bible says God has no memory of it. Yes. <laughs> How's God going to show a movie of something he has no memory of? Yes. But I've heard that preached. Yes. I'm not being smart. You know, it just come to the place there that if it's not really God, I don't even... Anyway. You know, in Acts chapter 20, let me give you a couple more scriptures. Peace with God. Not just the peace of God, but peace with God. What wonderful... Isn't that wonderful to have peace with God? Yes. You know, you watch people when they die. You know, as a minister, you go out sometimes with, and you can tell whether they know God, whether they've got peace with God. Some of them fight it to the last. Scratch the, down the back of the bed. I mean, they're terrified. Other people, there's just peace on their face because they have peace with God. They'll say things, the angels are just waiting. Just wait a little bit. I'll be ready to go in a minute. Jen's dad, when he was dying, knew the Lord was ready to go, you know, late 80s. And Jen's saying, it's a beautiful day, sunset, why don't you just take off? He says, but it's really hard to drop to die. I'm trying real hard, but it's hard to die. <laughs> <laughs> no fear, just peace. Peace with God. You can't buy that. I don't know you people. You may have peace of God, but do you really have peace with God? Absolute total assurance. Some people don't even know where they're going to go. One minute they say, they do something wrong, next thing they're going to hell. You know, every, think about this, every religion on the planet is based on your performance. If you're a Muslim, you've got to pray five times a day facing Mecca, that's bondage to me. What about if you miss one day? What happens then? If you're a Buddhist, and we study Buddhism before we say, you've got to keep attaining your performance to another level, a higher level, all based on what you do. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, got to go to church on a certain day, Old Testament Christianity, do good, get do good, do bad, get bad. But only the gospel of grace yeah. is not based on anything that you do or can do. Yeah. It's based on accepting what Jesus Christ has paid for you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Can I have an amen? amen. We have absolute peace with God. Amen. Not based on your performance. I'm not belittling that. Praise God. Is that right? But based on what He has done, accepting what He has done for us. Yes, yeah. yes. Where I live on the on the Gold Coast now, you know, I used to go to a bar yeah. rough as bags. Every second word's a swear word. I mean, if you took the swear words out of his vocabulary, would be strapped up. Hello? <laughs> Luck as guts is the best way I can put it. I mean, hello, but I go there and he's away and the lady barber, she's rougher than he is. <laughs> Swearing, tattooed. Now, well, praise God, don't get all cranky. You got a tattoo, that's cool. I just don't want one. Yeah. That's me. When you're going to get a tattoo, would you slap a bumper sticker on a Ferrari? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I front up there, you know, and here's this lady around, you know, and she's gone. And so I'm sitting there and she says, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a minister of the gospel. Well, the language changes immediately. <laughs> the language changes. Well, that's not the first time I've heard bad language. I don't think I've been like, but the language changes. Now she picks on God, and God did this, and God did that. I found out she's a backslidden Christian. I'm fine, I couldn't take any more. I said, lady, look at me. Look, look at me, look at me. I said, look at me. I said, look at me. I said, lady, God loves you just like you are. That's right. I didn't say she's saved. I said, God loves you, for God so loved the world. Oh, yeah. God is even kind to the unthankful and the evil, Jesus said. Is this correct? Now, maybe the church is not, but I'm telling you, the gospel of grace. I said, she said, well, you don't even know what I've done. I said, if it's based on what you or what I've done, I don't qualify. Yeah. I, I don't qualify. It's not based on what you've done or I've done. It's based on accepting what he has done for us. Yeah. That he paid, is that right? He paid a price that you and I could never pay. Yeah. Yeah. And she started to cry right there. She's crying. Hello, the barber salute. I never touched the lady. Hello. I never touched her. <laughs> Two weeks later, she turns up at church. Hallelujah. Now, what about if I said you're a mongrel going to hell? What? You think she would have come to church? I don't think so. But she turns up at church. No. No tracks rammed down their throats. You're a mongrel, turn or burn. Hello. She turns up at church. And so a month later, I go back. I go back to the barber. She's not there. The barber's there. The bloke's there. Rubber's bag still. He sees me. He brushes through the people. He comes up and says, I don't know what you did to Helen, but that must be one hell of a church. <laughs> he says, well, maybe you need to come too, mate. He says, it's not that bad yet. <laughs> Look at Acts, when, Acts chapter 20, if you found it there yet. Yeah. Acts chapter 20, look what it says in verse 24. Paul, a little five foot two, hook nosed Jew. Think about this. I mean, think about his life. He's beaten up, left for dead. I believe he was dead. He's stoned. That's not marijuana. Can I have an amen? <laughs> think of the things that what he says here in verse 21 4. But none of these things move me. I love it. We get bent out of shape, but Pastor doesn't acknowledge you and shake hands with you on that morning. But none of these things move me, he says, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my race with, with joy. I might finish my course with joy, and joy is not the name of his wife. <laughs> Think about it. He says, I, is that right? he could have said, I finished my course with great signs and wonders, and I'm sure they'll be there. I could have finished it with great prophetic anointing and power. And that. But he says, but I might finish. My course with joy. Amen. Because with the joy comes the strength. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen? He's saying, I don't even know what's before me, but that I might finish my course with joy. He goes on to say, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. And there he nails it. Yeah. The gospel of the grace, grace. of God. Amen. Listen to me. I, I understand there's some people out there that maybe are saying some things about grace, but don't think, say things like sloppy grace. It costs God his son. Yes. Yes. Every letter, every epistle Paul writes talks about the grace of God. In fact, he says, if anyone preaches any other gospel than the gospel we preach, let them be cursed. Read it for yourself. Let them be cursed. He said, read it for yourself. That's very strong language. He says, oh, you foolish Galatians, is that right? Yeah. Who has bewitched you that you would turn yeah. virtually from the gospel of grace and go back to performance again? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. It doesn't even work for the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Yeah. On the <laughs> we can learn. This, this, we can, see, I, I, this is me and I'm leaving later anyway. I don't understand. <laughs> I love the Jews. 800 horsemen, liberates, but I'm not one and I don't want to be one. Yeah. I love them. Hello, I don't wear the prayer shawls and dance around hallelujah, and keep all the people because I ain't one. 
Paul says, is that right? He says, if you're going to talk like that, he says, I was a Pharisee. Is that right? A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Is this correct? Like circumcised. Is that right? All of the things he says, and I count it as done. <clears throat> That I might know him. Read it for yourself. Yeah. A man that studied under Galileo himself was probably going to be a high priest. He says, I just counted all as done. That I might know him. And for the rest of my life, that I might preach the gospel of grace with joy. Amen, amen. I love it. Think about that. We need to live our life like somebody left the gate open. Yeah. I got a dog, a box of dog. You open the gate, she is gone. She loves it. Hello? You can tie her back with a steak. She ain't coming back. You know that song, Who Let the Dogs Out? Forget yeah. it. Who Let the Christians Out? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus did. Yeah. He yeah. paid yeah. the yeah. price. Yeah. Is that right? The chains are off. The gates are open. We're still living like somebody got the day gate closed. Yeah. Live your life like somebody let the gate open. Yeah. I love it. Just the awesomeness of God. That ability to share the word of God with great joy. Can I have an amen? amen. I, I, I don't know about you. I just love joyful people. There's something about it. Now listen to me. My wife's got a warped sense of humor. It fits real well with me. <laughs> I'm going through a really hard time a couple of years ago. I I'm, I'm lost a couple of friends that have died and things like that. And I'm, I'm struggling. So she sees it. She's going to come and pick me up from the airport. But she gets herself a long, long wig. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe wig and she you know borrows somebody else's dress and dark glasses my own daughters didn't recognize her and I'm standing at the airport waiting for my case and she comes and stands alongside them well you don't look at people I mean everybody's around I'm just standing and she goes poof like that goes, you're rude <laughs> So she walks and stands alongside me, and I'm about to say something. She grabs me and kisses me. <laughs> and she pulls the dark glass and went off and says, Just as well, you didn't enjoy that. <laughs> and I couldn't help laughing, and she's laughing, and the people around us are laughing. You know, there's something about a joy. It's just they make you Don't you feel better when you laugh? <laughs> I, I like people that have that sense of humor. My, my dad, think of my dad, when he was 90s when he died. My, my mum was almost 100 years old. Jan's mum. Jan's mum was the kindergarten nanny when she was 90 years of old. And the kids loved her. Anybody know? But you can't fool kids. I mean, the disciples, get away, rats. Is that what like Jesus said? No, you let the kids go. You can't fool kids. We used to have visiting ministry sometimes. Listen to me. And that kid would say, that looks as funny as a $3 bill. I said, don't say that. What's the matter with you, kid? And I found out later, they preach one thing, but they're totally different the way they lived. Yeah. My greatest joy, put them on a plane and fly away again. Is that right? <laughs> but you know, there is something about that. And, and my own family, I could see that. They're living into their, well up almost to their hundreds. Nothing to do with diet. My dad ate the crackling off the pork till the day gone. <laughs> but to this sick, I'd say, Dad, you can't eat like that. He says, Ah, oh, shut up, I'm not eating tree bark and lawn clippings. We're all good at 40 anyway. <laughs> what am I going to say? Never exercised a day in his life. <laughs> Hello, is that right? Is anybody? And one day we exercise and we take pills till we rattle up there. I'm not saying don't do that. We're eating tree bark and lawn clippings and rabbit food. <laughs> I didn't say don't do it. Jen, Jen's mum, she was a, we used to call her Mary Poppins. I just, I love, had an awesome, lovely attitude, peace of God. Just when she's ready to go, I just take off. You know, I never forget one day that we got to go down to the, the, the bush, we're going down to the jungle for a swim. I got Jen and the kids and. We're driving down where there's no crocodiles, okay? So this jungle water hole, we all jump out, and run in, and I find out there's a whole bunch of hippies in the nude. And I said, oh, get the cars. I said, where's Nana? Nana's sitting down there with them. Are you having a lovely day? Kids love to her, eh? Green kids love to her. <laughs> you know, we're having a bushfire. You don't get bushfire. But we've we got a bushfire sweeping the wards. I'm going to burn everything. I'm out there. Jen's dad's out there. My boys are in there. We're all fighting this. And where's Nana? Nana comes down with a tray. Anybody for a cup of tea? <laughs> Jen's dad says, get away, no woman. We're fighting for our lives. <laughs> To 
this day we miss Nana. There's something about I got, She just had that ability to brighten up a room. You know, I mean, that's just awesome. And she would never talk about herself. She'd sit down and she'd talk, what's happening with you? Is that right or not? You know, and she'd just bring people out. Is that right? Just to let people talk about themselves. Most people are interested to talk about themselves. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, Paul says that I might finish my course. That I might preach the gospel of grace the rest of my day. I like that. Thank you, Jesus. You know, doesn't it make you feel better to bring some hope to people? Yeah. And see people, you know, grovel and destroy. You know, not just peace of God, but peace with God. Yes. Absolute trust. It's the goodness of God that brings man to repentance. Yes. Yes. Come on. Can I have an amen or not? Yes. Yes. I mean, you know those scriptures the same as I know those scriptures. You know, there's a very close correlation between grace and with joy. If you see that word there, the word for grace is charis, C-H-A-R-S, where we get our word charismatic. But the word for joy is simply one letter difference, chara. But they both come from the same root word, charo. In fact, if you get a Greek dictionary, it tells us that the words are so close that you can't always tell the difference between grace and joy. So it's telling me, so grace and joy go together. It's telling me that grace is a source of our joy. It's telling me that grace can be measured in your life by the degree of joy that's here. I like it. Why do we have these moves of God where people just laugh for no apparent reason? They just laugh. Can I have an amen? Yeah. How come the highest paid entertainers are comedians? Yeah. Just to make people laugh, is that right? Yes, it makes you feel better. A merry heart, do it good like a medicine. Yeah. And, a, and, a, and a broken spirit dries the bones. Yeah. Can I have an amen? Yeah. It's just the ability to laugh sometimes. Sometimes that's what you've got to do is just laugh. You know, we had a real bad situation, I better not tell you what, but something dramatic happened in our church in Darwin. The guy is still in prison to this day. And so the I'm getting on a plane to go to a, a conference a, a little bit after this. I, I, I'm close to being depressed. I have two associate pastors we get on, but the moment we get on the plane and we leave the situation, we start to laugh. We, we laugh for four hours. Which I couldn't help it. I mean, it's just stupid. There's no even reason, but you're laughing. And so the ear hostess is coming out. She dropped the whole tray of coffee. We're all laughing, you know. And she said, what do you do for a living? Are you comedians? <laughs> I said, I'm in the ministry, lady. She said, you know, it's a lie about <laughs> Anyway, and she kept asking us, what do you do? I don't like that terminology coming, uh, a final approach. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming in to land. And she comes up and says, look, we're about to land. What do you do for a living? Are you comedians? And my associate pastor says, well, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm taking these blokes to Happy Hackers. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I can believe that. <laughs> I said, she couldn't believe I'm in the ministry, but she can believe I'm a nutcase. <laughs> because that's not what normally is portrayed in ministry. Yeah. Most yeah. of the times the clothes they wear are black clothes, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Is that right? No. You know, it bothered me when Jen and I, 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 I barely even knew what a church was all about. She comes from a Catholic background. I come from nothing. Hello? You know, and I'm just thinking, I grew up in a real small country town. I'm talking real small. I mean, so small that our heavy industry was a 300-pound Avon lady. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking real small. You know, and you grow up in a, in a town, tall, steep, or few people. But I never, before God, I never heard the gospel until I was married with kids. I heard religion, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. I never heard the gospel. I, I had a friend out of the Navy, he gets, you know, he... he, he Gets out of the Navy, joins the ministry, black coat, turned back collar, comes to visit me in my gun shop. He's got a cross hanging around his neck. You could anchor the Queen Mary to you. <laughs> I never heard the gospel. I just heard religion. It turned me off. In fact, it turned my wife and I so much off that we started off into yoga and Buddhism and all weird. It's just weird. <laughs> but today, before God, today my wife and I heard the gospel. The gospel of grace, we both gave our lives, Lord, and that's nearly 50 years ago, we've never looked back. The day we heard the gospel of grace, something inside of me said, this is it. Is that right or not? I knew it was wrong. We've never, we've never backslidden, never wanted to go back, there's nothing to go back to. I was almost an alcoholic, I gave up drinking because guzzling was quicker. <laughs> and I was a drunk. But the day I got saved, the day I got saved, all desire for booze left. 
Now, if you know anything about that, that's a hard thing to show. But I've never from that moment ever desired it. Just like that, said three. The goodness of God, the grace of God. And I have an amen. You know, as I say here, that absolute peace of nothing else, when you hear that gospel of grace, it brings peace. I've sat in, in Joseph Church, these guys have been over with us, and I've watched people that have been in ministry 30, 40 years break down and cry just in the service and say, where have I been all my life? Anybody know the door? Yeah. One guy's going to quit on his marriage, he's going to close his church. I didn't know this till later. And just the gospel of grace, his church has doubled in size. He rang me and he says, I'm in love with my wife and my kids are restored. He says, I feel again like I'm just born again again. Peace of God. The grace of God. You don't get that when they're talking about the storm troopers are coming to get you. And you're mongrel. Is that right? If you miss it, you're all going to hell. Is that right? Just the grace of God, the goodness. Anyway. Thank you, Jesus. I preach myself happy anyway. <laughs> In first John. I might go for a couple of days though, right? <laughs> they said, What time do you finish? They said Tuesday. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but in first John chapter First John chapter 4, verse 17, says, Love has been perfected among us. In this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Oh, is that awesome? <laughs> boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Yes. Boldness in the day of judgment. Is that right? There is no love, a few in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. I hear people say, I found the Lord, now he found you. Yeah. You responded, but he found you. We love him because he first loved us. Yeah. When we were a mess, I mean, when we were so far away from God that we wouldn't even know his name except in a square word. But he still loved us. Yeah. You know, I would tell my people, you know, you've got to love God more, you've got to love God more. You know, perfect love casts out all fear. Then I realise that it's impossible for me to have perfect love. How can I possibly have perfect love? So I'm driving my people to attain to something that's unattainable. And I've got a revelation. He's not talking about my love for him. He's talking about his love for me. I get a revelation of just how much he loves me. Warts and all. Sometimes I hear the voice of God inside me say, I love you, Eve. I even like you. <laughs> I don't know all about you. When you confess, it's not when God found out about your sins. <laughs> He says, I love you. I even like you. You know, we talk about listening for the inner voice. He's a better. Listen for the friendly voice. Yeah. That friendly voice inside you. Yeah. And they have an amen to walk. But everybody, the only things that love you, un unconditionally your life is God and your dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my dog loves you unconditionally. It doesn't matter whether I stink or what. I got, if I come home and jump so late, the only things that love you unconditionally is your dog and God. Everything else is conditional. Anyway, you know, if I could just encourage just um, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the favor. You know, sometimes we, we, I think we, we, we look at the disciples as super spiritual people, but they were humans like you and I. They missed it. You know, I've heard people preach about they were waiting in the upper room, waiting for the, the, the Holy Spirit. They were in the upper room because they were scared stiff of the Jews. Yes. And I don't think facts get in the way of a good story. You don't look at me real strange. But go with me to John, let me prove it to you if that's what you want. In John chapter 20, in John chapter 20, let's read from verse 17, Jesus said, Do not, uh, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord and spoken these things to her. Then the same evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews. Yeah. Excuse me, is that what it says? Yeah. No, the Bible facts get in the way of a good story. They're, they're petrified, they're scared. And Jesus turns up, I don't know about you, but I love it. He turns up, what's the first thing he says? It's peace, people. Yeah. Peace. They're scared, stupid, he says peace. Is that right? Peace be with you. I like it. Look at verse 21. So Jesus said, and peace to you. I like that. Then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. The peace of God. There's no substitute for the peace of God. There's no substitute for peace with God. There is a grace to live. There's a grace to die. 
I believe there is a grace to die. That when it's your turn, when it's time to go, there's absolute peace and assurance. Is that right? Yes. Not? But you know where you go. I mean, isn't that better than tubes up your nose and scared stiff, you know? But you just sit back there, absolute peace. Is that right? I've heard people say there's an angel waiting. Just hang on for a bit. I'll be there in a bit. Just wait a little while. I'm not quite ready yet. But absolute peace. Can I have an amen? amen. Some people see things. Some people see ghosts. All sorts of terrible things. Just the peace of God. Peace with God. Absolute assurance that you know where you're Money can't buy it. I don't care what. Money can't buy it. I really believe that people would understand that they could have peace with God. They would do. Is that right? I mean, they would do anything to gain that peace with God. Right. People fight. They're, 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 anyway, they're, things like that. But you know, it's just an unmerited favor. They're up to 35 years in ministry, maybe 38. Come to this revelation that faith is a rest. We made it a fight. The faith is rest. There is a rest for the people of God. Is that right? There is a rest for the people of God. It talks about that. You know, as I say, I just love that. You know, as I say, I'm not sure if we even know how to rest anymore. Uh, look with me in Luke chapter 10. A couple of scriptures, and I want to keep you real long. But Luke chapter 10, and I know you're familiar with the story. It's uh, Mary and Martha. Heard it preached different ways, but verse 38, as it happened, they went into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into a house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with not serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you're worried, you're troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. Not 15 things or 45 steps or 33 formulas. One thing. Is that right? I mean, even though Jesus said, if I be lifted up, yeah, yeah. that he should be first place in our life. Is this correct? Not. Yeah. Let, let me put it in the current vernacular so you understand. I saw Aussie's Kiwis, you know. Here's Martha, she's out working her guts out. And she's chops and sausages on. Is that right? Jesus, I know that's the right thing to do. You should be serving your guests. How much more of it, Jesus? She's out there making, you know, hamburgers and chops and sausages. And she comes and says, I'm working my guts head out there. And this lazy slob sitting there doing nothing. Tell her to come and give me a hand. Is that right? That's the right thing to do, you'd think. But Jesus says, you're more concerned about what people will think about you. You're all performance, but I feel like I was going to come. And for you, it's all about performance. Is that right? Not what people will say about you or what people will think about it. But Mary has chosen the most important thing. Is that right? Here you've got Jesus, the living word of God. The peace of God is right here in the building. And she's going to get one chance to draw from that. Is that right? One opportunity. Maybe at the rest. Only, and, and she says, you think I'm going to be out there cooking chops? Forget it. If you want to be fed, Jesus, you better do another loaves and fishes trick. Because I'm not leaving this spot until I receive. And Jesus commends her. Not Martha. Well, let me ask you a question because I don't know you people. Are you a Martha or are you a Mary? You're more concerned about performance, doing, you know, what people will think about us. Is that right? Mary is only concerned about receiving from you. And Jesus says she's chosen, one translation says, the most important. And what she's chosen won't be taken away from you. I don't know. Are you led or are you driven? One of these people is led and one's driven. Martha's driven. She is driven. Something inside of her just won't let her relax. Is driving and pushing but Mary, is that right or not? Is sitting there saying, I'm just going to see. I don't care what people think. I don't even really. You know, I understand we need ministry of help. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor's all in shock right about now. Is that right? I understand. But he's talking about your priority of life. Yeah. 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 I'm not being smart. But so easy. There is a very fine line between, between being led and being driven. You can come up with some idea and you want to push it through yourself. I find a lot of times, a lot of times now, I just stop and say, I'm just pushing this thing myself. And i got to stop. I just say, look, I'm sorry, I'm just pushing this. And i got to step back. If it's not God, I don't even really want to do it. Now, this is just me. You, you make, but I'm just saying, I realize I'm just pushing this thing. It may work, it may not work. See, if you want to grow your church, it might work, it may not, but you'll have to make it work. Yeah. He said, but I'll build my church. If I be lifted up, if you be lifted up, is that right or not? And you're the focal point of everything else, or what? Is that right? It's all about I, me, and my. It might work. It may even work, but you're going to have to make it. Yeah. 
pero he vivido usted. Is that right or not? Are you married or are you not? I, I don't know. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I just know in my own heart. And I began to realize, you know, you can, so often we do, we go to God and we hold it up and say, this is my plan, rubber stamp this. Well, here's another idea. What about the will of God? <laughs> Doesn't the will of God even come into the equation anymore? This is what we want to do. Is that right? I saw somebody else do it. It worked for them. I remember years ago, we went to Yongbi Cho's church in South Korea. A million people in the church. We had an audience. This is awesome. Hello. And he's talking about his home fellowships. What do they call them? Um, uh, cell groups. Cell groups. I thought, oh, this is awesome. If you build a church of a million people, I'm going to go back to Darwin and I'm going to make it work. I felt that on the face. It didn't work. Nothing worked. Yeah. Now, that was the word of God for Cho. It wasn't for me. Is this too deep? Just because it's a formula, I'm not knocking the formula, but just because it works for Hillsong or it works for Joe, doesn't mean to say necessarily it work for you and me. Here's a novel idea, just search, search God out for yourself and see what he wants you to do in your situation. Amen. Your town, your place, can I have an amen or what? Amen. You know, it's just awesome, sometimes you go to really time. These guys know I'm talking about, well anyway, Stephen and Kathy Gray, when we first went to their church, a little place called Smithton in the United States, they have more people in their church than live in the town. Right. The church population is bigger than the town. We've been there, the whole floor is jumping and 10 year olds are jumping on the chairs and prophesying, you know, that didn't just happen and finally, you know, the, 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 the town council said, leave, we can't handle you anymore, go, 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 they moved to Kansas City. It's called the Kansas City Revival, they've been in revival now. Still. They're still in revival, along yeah. with the Brownsville, any other church, I don't know, still in Why? Because they're doing what God told them. Yes. Can I have a name in a while? Yeah. They didn't copy somebody else, here's a good idea, we'll make this. They just listen to the voice of God for themselves. Anyway, why do you call me Lord? You don't even do the things that I ask you to do. You are Martha, or you are Mary. Performance or grace. Just think about it. You know, I was thinking about this a little while ago. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He says, what do I got to do to get saved? He believes that he's operating in the Lord. And Jesus said, well, you know what to do? And he says, I do all that. I keep all that. Well, he never, he, but he thinks he does. But he's living under the law. So Jesus said, okay, you want to live under the law? What's the first command of the law? You'll have no God before me. Your God's money. And I built a doctrine on it. He told this young man, not anybody else. He said, you take your God, your money, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. He says, I, I can't do that. Is that right? Hello? Performance-based. A little bit later, hello, the tax collector, Zacchaeus, an absolute total crook. But he's seeking Jesus. He climbs a tree. He's trying. So he's coming to Jesus. And Jesus spots him. He says, hey, Zach, Zach, I'm coming to your house for lunch today. Is that right or not? In the presence of grace, listen to me. What does Zacchaeus say? Everything I've ever stolen, I'll return it. Amen. Half of my goods, I'll give it to the poor. And what does Jesus say? Today, salvation has come to your hands. Yeah. Yeah. One's performance, and one's based on the grace of God. If you want to live under before, if you want to live under law, go for it, Jack. But you're going to have to keep the whole lot. Yeah. And if you miss one, you're guilty of the whole lot. It's impossible to keep. But we try it all the time. This is just me, and I'm not being smart, but I find most churches a little bit of grace and a little bit of law. Yeah. Somebody comes along and makes us all, all feel guilty, so we run back under law, hallelujah, praise God. And somebody comes and preaches grace, now we run back into grace. Yeah. We don't even know where we fit. We're sort of so confused, we run between the two. But Paul says, I want to preach the gospel of grace. Amen. With joy for the rest of my life. The grace of apostles. The only, listen to me, and I'll close off here. The only disciple that doesn't die a martyr's death is John. The only one. The disciple whom Jesus loved. John wrote that about himself. Boom, boom, how deep is that? <laughs> when I read this, I thought, this guy's in love with his mirror. The only person, the only bloke, the only gospel that describes him as the disciple whom Jesus loved is the one he wrote himself. <laughs> Hello, I'm thinking, this guy's in love with himself. Then I got a revelation, he's the only one that understands grace. The others are saying, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? He says, I just want to love it. lay with my head on Jesus' breast. Is that right? The others say, who's going to be the greatest? He says, all I want to do is be with Jesus. Is that right or not? Yeah. At the cross, he's the only one still there. Yeah. Jesus commends, commits his mother into John's hands. Yeah. They try to kill him. They try to boil him. Is that right? They couldn't kill him, so they put him on the Isle of Patmos. Most people think he died there. No, he didn't. 
was there maybe nine months, and when he's pardoned, or when there's a change in Roman government, he goes back, listen to me, to Ephesus, and he takes care of Jesus' mother for the rest of her life. Yeah. Love never fails. Yeah. They couldn't kill him. They tried to boil him alive and could not kill him. Yeah. Love never fails. Grace or love. Performance or the grace of God. I believe with all my heart, you know, what I've seen is so many lives and ministries change. Families change, so much joy coming back into the church. You know what it is? Because of the grace of God. Yes. I don't have to do it myself. I can't do it myself. I've tried a long time. I know I can't make it happen myself. Let me just close up with one last scripture. Go to Isaiah with me if you would. Isaiah, Isaiah, where are we? I think it's 50. Did it? Did it? I'll find it for you. <laughs> Isaiah 35. Where is the passage? Help me, Jan. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lord. You got it? You're being rebellious on me. Yes. Isaiah chapter 35. How many of you believe the Bible? Yep. And Isaiah is gazing down the corridors of history and he begins to prophesy what he sees for the end time church. Yep. Want to know what he sees for the end time church? This is not some prophet, this is Isaiah. And it says in verse 10 of chapter 35, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. If ever there was a generation that needs to be ransomed, it's this one. There's more drugs, there's more crime, there's illicit sex, is that right or not? More than any other generation, it says, and the ransom of the Lord shall return, and they'll come to Zion. Hello, listen to me. There is a natural Israel, there is a spiritual Israel. And it says, they'll come back to Zion. Come to Zion with singing. What? And he says, I look down and I see a, a what, what's that thing? And he says, with everlasting joy upon their heads. <laughs> They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. He's prophesying what he sees for the end time church. Gazing down the corridors of history, he sees this thing on the head. How many of you know the predominant thing? If you're in the army, the badge of, badge of insignia rank is on the head. If you're a police officer, the first thing you see is that hat. If you're a fireman, is that right? What recognizes the hat? The thing he says I see, and we think it's great signs and wonders and power gifts, and I'm sure they'll be there. He says, but the thing that I see. Above anything else, is joy on the heads. Why on the heads? Because your face is on your head. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happens here is advertising. Yes. Do I not? Watch it the All Blacks when they play. You're not going to ask if they win. <laughs> <laughs> they lost. Yeah. National morning. Is that right? They're not going to ask anybody. It's advertised, not on your hands, it's advertised on your face. You get up in the morning, it's on your face. He says, I see the predominant sign of the end of why? Because with the joy will come the strength. What will bring the young people back to the church in droves is joy. Oh, I love this generation. They're not, is that right? They'll just tell you like it is. If you need it, they'll tell you that. Is that right? I'm no beating around the bush. Is that right? They'll just tell you straight. He says, the predominant, predominant sign I see for the end time church is joy. And with the joy will come peace. And with that comes the strength. I don't know about you. That's awesome. I really believe in these last days, you're going to see a joyful church. Packed with singing and worshipping God. And you've got a world that's going nuts, a neurotic society going to say, there's something, you don't have to walk out and say, do you want to track? I'll say, there's something different about you. Is that right? There's something different. What, what is it? There's peace, there's joy. Share with me. I want to, what do I, you know, is it a pill? Is it a bottle? Is it a place? What is it? Help me. You just better tell them what's going on in there. That I might finish my course with joy and preach the gospel of grace at the end of his days. Father, I just give you the praise and the glory. I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. I speak a blessing over these people. Oh Lord, I just I just speak a, a blessing. I call them the head and not the tail and above and not the lid. I say whatever they turn their hands to shall prosper and succeed. <clears throat> that the enemy shall no longer find opportunities to rob, to kill and destroy. And Lord, I just loose that anointing of joy and peace on these people. In fact, can I get you to stand up? Come on, everybody. Quickly, just stand up. And would you join hands up? Just join hands even across the road there. There's too many people there. just for us to lay hands on. But you know, that anointing, you know, I really believe the anointing is more important than it's taught. You know, and I just sense, how many of you know Elijah imparted to Elisha? And Paul says, stir up the gift which I imparted to you and I laid my hands upon you. It must be possible to impart things from one person to another. But you can't impart something you don't have.
I might be a nut, but I'm happy nut. <laughs> when I'm a nut, you must be happy about it. Yeah. Don't shake my tree, I'm happy. <laughs> I really believe that right now, if you just close your eyes and just receive the peace of God, the peace that surpasses all understanding, not only peace of God, but peace with God, absolute assurance that you're in right standing with God. Not because of anything you did or didn't do, but because of what Jesus paid for you. By the grace of God, we just receive that into our lives. The joy, Jesus says, that my joy, I, I give to you, my joy, that your joy may be full. My, my, it's my joy, he says, I give to you, that your joy may be full. So, Lord, I just reach into the realm of the Spirit and just loose that anointing. Lord, I just let that anointing flow back through these through these rows and touch people's lives. Some of them, some of them, Lord, that need that joy. Some of them that need that absolute peace. And Lord, I just believe that right now that anointing, just like electricity flowing up and down electrical conduits and, and wires is flowing up and down these people. And just touching the people that open their hearts to receive, Lord. And I just thank you for it right now. The peace of God. Peace with God. Absolute joy. In a world that's fast going nuts. We just give you the praise. Awesome God, awesome God. I just thank you for your grace. I just thank you for your favor. Lord, it's just so wonderful. We don't have to perform. We don't have to measure up to anything. Just receiving your grace. For those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life as kings. We thank you. Praise the Lord Jesus' name.